Choi versus Callista Silgado. Let's talk about the fight. This was a fight where Hyun Mi Choi got off to a very strong start. She almost got Callista out of there early in the match. And I think that in sensing that she had her woman hurt, that she's ready to go, Hyun Mi Choi abandoned her form and, and, and decided to trade hooks on the inside, thereby allowing Callista to get into this fight. Callista the much smaller fighter yeah. who would need to get mid-range to inside to do anything. Callista started getting off shots of her own, getting off those shots in the pocket where Hyun Mi Choi didn't really need to be. She didn't need to be that close to Callista to connect, to land damaging blows. You'll notice that in the early goings of the fight, when, when Hyun Mi Choi was setting up the right hand, the right hand up top, the right hand downstairs, off the jab, behind straight punches, there was very little that Callista could do about it, as Hyun Mi Choi was outside of Callista's striking distance. He couldn't reach her. Hyun Mi Choi being the taller, more statuesque fighter, behind the straight shots for Callista. He couldn't reach her. And behind the straight shots, Hyun Mi Choi got Callista hurt, buzzed Callista Silgado several times. Some point after the third, Hyun Mi Choi must have sensed that Callista was ready to go and, and poured it on. In so many words, became a slave to the moment, opted to trade hooks on the inside where, you know, she really didn't need to. You don't need to be that close to Callista Silgado to pour it on. You just need to stay on your jab, set up the right hand, and, and, and fight the fight long range. Long distance. Where she can't touch you. In that way, what shots Hyun Mi Choi did absorb were shots that she didn't need to absorb. She took punches that she didn't need to take. She was fully capable of fighting this fight long range, behind straight shots, behind her jab, and, and, and securing a comfortable win, what looked to be what could have been a comfortable knockout. So there are some glaring defensive deficiencies there that need to be addressed ahead of what could very well be a Terry Harper unification match in 2021 that, you know, Hyun Mi Choi she can be drawn out into a war mm -hmm. and, and, you know, she can go looking for one needlessly and that could cost her. That could cost her the WBA title. And, and these were glaring deficiencies that I'm sure Steffi Bull, Terry Harper, Michaela Mayer, and Maiva Hamadouche were all paying close attention to that Hyun Mi Choi. She's leaning over the front foot a bit too much. She is vulnerable to short punches, short counter shots, deep in the pocket, in the heat of the exchange. Mm -hmm. There is a question of Hyun Mi's composure, you know, her poise, because I reiterate, she started off the fight very strong and looked like she could have gotten Callista Silgado out of there early. She could have. But it looks a lot like Hyun Mi Choi sensed that Callista was in trouble, sensed that Callista was ready to go, and rather than, you know, continuing to set up her shots, set up the right hand, set up the, the stabs to the body downstairs, rather than continuing to do that, Hyun Mi Choi lost her composure and opted to make it a war, all of her own volition. It was a question of Hyun Mi's fitness as well. Make no mistake, this was a fight that Hyun Mi Choi was clearly winning, though she made it much harder than it needed to be. It was a fight that she was clearly winning. However, she was starting to fade down the stretch as the fight progressed into the later rounds, the last leg of the fight. Yeah, she was getting tired. In the last leg of the fight, she lost her form there a couple of times, and, and you know, it's not all bad. It was an entertaining fight, and it was a fight that Hyun Mi Choi was clearly winning. It's just that the feeling, the takeaway after the fight, you know, at least for me, was that Hyun Mi Choi did make the fight harder than it needed to be, where she could have easily won with an emphatic knockout 
in the first half of the fight had she not opted to trade hooks on the inside. You know, maybe Hyun Mi Choi wanted to make an impression on the boxing community, the boxing fans at large, this being her U.S. debut, her matchroom debut. Maybe she wanted to win the fight in dramatic fashion, and that's why she decided to, to you know, make it a war where it didn't need to be a, a, a war. She wanted to make a statement. Could be that way. But, you know, so long as Hyun Mi Choi is working behind the lead hand and doubling up on it, tripling up on it, setting up the power shots, she's very formidable. She did show a good chin. She ate some hard shots and kept on coming. There's a lot of toughness there. And a few deficiencies aside, she's still a very entertaining fighter to watch, just as entertaining as I remember. Congratulations to Hyun Mi Choi for advancing to a professional record of 18-0, 18 wins, no losses. I want to say that in spite of making the fight harder than it needed to be, there were virtues there. Yumi Choi showed her toughness, showed her grit. She absorbed some hard shots and kept on fighting, kept on coming. What that communicates to me is she's not going to crumble off the first hard shot that lands. And if the girl opposite the ring wants to make it a war, Hyun Mi Choi will oblige her. She's not squirrely in the pocket the way some other statuesque fighters are. She's not going to dive into a clinch. She's going to trade punches that if that's what you want, that's what you're going to get. And like all things, there are pros to that mentality, to that methodology. There are pros and there are cons. It all depends on who's opposite the ring. Hyun Mi Choi's best punches are her straight punches, and that comes as no surprise because Hyun Mi Choi does have generous proportions, generous dimensions for the super featherweight division. You know, she, she's statuesque for this weight. When she gets off straight shots, she can generate respectable power, so long as she stays on a jab and sets those shots up. It was an entertaining fight from start to finish. It was a hell of a lot more entertaining than that Ryder versus Guy fight. I'm not even going to get into that. With that being said, Hyun Mi Choi has arrived. Congratulations to her on another successful title defense. On to the main event of that same card, the Triple G versus Camille Zeremata IBF mandated title defense. How to gauge this performance? I, I don't rate how Golovkin looked in this fight to how he looked against Sergei Dirivyanchenko because Sergei is a much higher tier of opponent, better quality of opponent than Camille Zeremata was. Thus, if Triple G looked in some way, shape, or form better in this fight than he looked in that fight, it would likely have to do with who the man opposite the ring is and, 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 and what his levels are, what he is capable of. I choose to rate this performance against the Steve Rolls fight as I view Camille Zeremata and Steve Rolls as being more or less in the same place, the same kind of guy. You know, unbeaten guy so far, but has not yet made a statement on the world stage at the world level. And, and based on those two performances, I will say that Triple G looked much better with Camille Zeremata than he did against Steve Rolls. Looks like they taught an old dog new tricks. I'll say that as I watched this fight, what, what resonated with me the most was that it really does look like the pairing, the partnership with Jonathan Banks is finally starting to sink in and we are starting to see the fruits of their labor manifest in Triple G's performance because, you know, that, that that's the most head movement I've ever seen from Triple G. And, and I've been watching this guy's career for a long time and I gotta tell you, just, just just go back to the Steve Rolls fight and, and watch that fight and pay attention that, you know, there were moments where Steve Rolls was actually snapping back Triple G's head with jabs, you know, with straight shots. Whereas in this fight, you know, you saw a conservative effort from Triple G to stay off the line, stay off the center, and don't get hit with nothing that you don't need to get hit with. This has got to be in the best interest of preservation. This conservative effort, which was quite noticeable from where I was sitting, this has to be in the best interests of preservation, being mindful that Triple G, strong puncher that he might be, He's 38 years old, and, and you can't just go in there anymore taking shots straight to the face. If I'm being honest, I think that Triple G carried this guy. I do. I think that Triple G was pulling his punches as, as a concentrated effort to get the rounds in and work on things. I feel like Triple G knew that he can get this guy out of there whenever the hell he wants. You know, as soon as he lets his hands go, there's very little that Camille Zeremata can do about it. And if the fight lasted as long as it did, it's because both Triple G and Jonathan Banks were making a concentrated effort to get the rounds in, to work on what they've been working on in the gym. In a low-risk situation. Against a low-risk opponent. It did look to me like Triple G was 
pulling his punches and he was being a bit more economic than usual. He wasn't pumping out the jab, pumping out the lead hand as often, as much as he normally does. And I think it's because, you know, when they went into this fight, they weren't just going into this fight to get the W. They weren't just going into this fight to win. They wanted to use this fight as an opportunity to put certain things into practice. Should we talk about... You know, Triple G's head movement, which I think was the star of the show, where normally Triple G's jab, his lead hand, and the frequency of times he, he lets that shot go, where normally that's the star of the show. In this fight, it really was Triple G's head movement that, 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 that really got my attention. You know, he was slipping shots, rolling shots, getting under shots, riding punches. I mean, that really is the most upper body movement and head movement that I've ever seen in a Triple G fight. And I think it's because they taught an old dog new tricks because he's an old dog. Because he can't keep taking shots to the face. The wars he's had in the past, you know. The second Canelo Alvarez fight, the Daniel Jacobs fight, more recently the Sergei Irivianchenko fight. Those were punishing fights, the kind of fights that, yeah, that they, they actually can take years off a fighter's career. Triple G got hit a lot in those fights, and, and, and I think what we're seeing now is a conservative effort to prevent Triple G from taking on that kind of punishment moving forward. So we saw a more defensive Triple G, a more economic Triple G, a Triple G that was actually working on his countering ability, his counter shots. And I'm sure you guys are aware that he knocked Camille Zeremata down in this fight several times throughout the course of it in the early goings of the fight. And, and I noticed that, you know, when he knocked the guy down, he wasn't necessarily going for the kill before or after the knockdown. Not always. You know, maybe the last two times he knocked a guy down. You know, the last two times. You know, those times it looked like, okay, he was ready to close the show. But in the early goings of the fight, the first couple of knockdowns that he scored over Camille Zeremata, they just, they just kind of happened. And he kind of let him off the hook afterwards. That being said, this isn't the kind of victory or the kind of performance that you shout from the rooftops about because, lest we forget, this is Camille Zeremata he was opposite the ring with. Unheralded guy, unbeaten guy, but unheralded guy nonetheless. That being said, I like how Triple G looked. I like that he was a lot more defensively responsible than he normally is. Power's still there. With a few nifty additions. You often hear it said that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, Triple G, you know, don't tell him that. So that's what he's got. You know, he's staying off the line, staying off the center, slipping shots, rolling shots, riding punches, using his torso. Moving it. Moving his head. He's, he's looking to improve upon his ability to counter shots than rather that, that you know, rather than just, you know, pumping out the jab and pouring it on and, and taking a few hard shots to get that done, he, he's being a, a bit more crafty. And I like it. I like it a lot. And the question now is, can Gennady Golovkin maintain that same kind of implementation, that same kind of methodology? Can he maintain that aesthetic against a higher tier, a higher caliber of opponent? Because that's what it's going to take to really convince the boxing community at large that Gennady has caught his second wind in his career, that he's not quite circling the drain just yet, and that he has found the fountain of youth, rather... So dog's got some new tricks. So while this isn't the kind of victory that you shout from the rooftops about, it was a good showing, an encouraging showing from Gennady Golovkin. Congratulations to him on a successful title defense. And finally, we come to this weekend's big super middleweight title fight between Canelo Alvarez, the now unified and Ring Magazine super middleweight champion, and the then unbeaten Callum Smith. I want to say that, for the most part, this was a boxing masterclass for Canelo Alvarez, who took away many of the natural advantages the very statuesque Callum Smith possessed going into this fight. He took away his height, he took away his reach, he took away his jab. And for 11 rounds, at least on my card, he bullied the much bigger Callum Smith around from turnbuckle to turnbuckle. And his size just didn't matter. It wasn't by way of brute force that Canelo Alvarez bullied Callum Smith around so much as timing and punch placement. In the build up of this fight, I told you guys that it was going to be very awkward for Callum Smith to try to deal with Canelo Alvarez because he's not going to be able to keep him out with the straight shots, he's not going to be able to keep him out with the jab, but he can't run the risk of trading blows with him deep in the pocket, mid-range to inside. At that range, it's that much easier for Canelo Alvarez to get off and land those photo finish punches, those hard shots. So he can't keep the guy out. He can't trade shots with him on the inside, and that puts Callum in a situation to where 
The only way he can get any air is to give up ground, give up real estate to Canelo Alvarez as he's coming forward. And in doing so, Callum ends up with his back against the ropes several times. Listen, it wasn't for lack of trying. You know, there were moments in there, bursts of aggression from Callum Smith to where he's trying to fight the guy off. He's trying to shake him, but he can't. Canelo Alvarez knows how to stay off the line, stay off the center. Mother of guys work at the same time. So that the guy, the naturally bigger guy, can't get much leverage for his shots. There's just not enough room to work there, not enough room to effectively throw and land respectable punches. Those bursts of aggression from Callum Smith were either blocked, slipped, or weaved all together. He was having no success. While he's getting pushed around. Callum was doing his best to try and shake and bake this guy, and it really was to no avail. It does appear that at some point in the fight, perhaps Callum Smith had torn his left bicep post-fight it, it, it looked pretty bad to have been protruding. It's a nasty fucking injury. And if I had to guess, I'd say that the left bicep injury on Callum Smith's left arm, his left hand, his jab hand, that was likely caused by hyperextending with the lead hand, shooting that jab and hitting nothing but air several times. Forcefully. Extending, rather hyperextending with the lead hand forcefully to try to land with authority and, and coming up short hitting nothing but air. I think it, it, at some point in the match, that's what caused the bicep tear. How much more difficult does that make the situation? You have to appreciate the level of ring savvy, the level of ring IQ, IQ. it takes to disarm someone as statuesque with as many physical gifts, the physical dimensions of a Callum Smith, because Canelo Alvarez isn't a big guy at all. And Canelo didn't win this fight through strength of arms, he won this fight through precision punching and timing. That's what beat Callum Smith. That's what disarmed him. You can shoot your shot at the same time that he shoots his shot, and the difference is his is gonna land and yours isn't. Oh. And now round after round, this can become very discouraging, very disheartening for the fighter. I think after a while, Callum Smith made a decision that he's content, he's comfortable just surviving. It wasn't the most ambitious performance from Callum Smith, far from it. If I'm being honest, it's not like Canelo Alvarez gave him very many opportunities to be ambitious. If Callum Smith had opened up more than he did, you know what would have happened. Canelo would have knocked him out. That's what the fuck would have happened. Callum Smith knew it. So after a while, this guy's just content surviving, going through the motions, being walked from one side of the ring to the other. To avoid taking punishment. I want to congratulate Canelo Alvarez for showing his class, showing his ring savvy, his ring IQ, and showing that size, size alone, in and of itself, is not enough against Canelo Alvarez.